You've all been waiting so patiently for this video, which has taken a lot more research than I had originally anticipated. And you'll see why later in the video. Anyhow, if you want to see how we got to this point, just check the playlist in the card up top. But what really inspired me to do this project in the first place was the whole PC versus console debate. But that's not what this video is about. And don't get me wrong, I own consoles, quite a few actually, but I wanted to debunk this argument that PCs are always considerably more expensive, and I wanted to show people that you can get into PC gaming for console levels of money without having to take a step back in performance. But we'll get to those at the end of the video. First, let's talk about what we're working with here. And this all started with this Optiplex 9020, and we're going to be adding in this full-size 1066 gig. Um, we're also going to add a 140 millimeter fan at the front for some minimal airflow. And lastly, we're going to be adding this 250 gig uh, SSD as our boot drive. They're just so cheap these days that there's really no reason to be running Windows off of a conventional hard drive anymore. Besides, they're one of the best upgrades for these older systems because they really, feel, ugh, really make it feel like a much newer PC. Now, before we start, I want to give you a quick disclaimer here. And this isn't going to be a PC building tutorial, but if you want to see me do one of those, just let me know down in the comments and we can do the polar opposite of that verge abomination. Anyways, we've got all the parts here and ready to go. Uh, I just want to start out by cleaning them up before we put everything back in the case. All right, so everything's clean, but there's one more thing that I recommend you do, and that's replace the thermal paste on the CPU. I guess it's possible that it could still be fine, but probably not. And as you can see, that old paste had pretty much turned to dust. And had I left it that way, it would have given us temperature issues. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that it might be a good idea to replace your CMOS battery, but uh, anyways, let's go ahead and start throwing all of this crap back into the case. All right, so now we're to the point where we need to deal with all of our changes. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with the front fan. And to do this, all we need is a screwdriver and obviously a fan. And like I said in the fan mod video, I prefer a 140 mil fan that's more optimized for airflow for this. So I'm gonna be using this iGo fan because it looks all right, has decent airflow, it's cheap, and it's also pretty quiet. Now, I position it so that the cable's facing the back panel so that I can route it cleanly with the front USB cables. And then you just have to line up the holes in the fan with the holes in the front panel and secure it with the included screws. All right, so the fan's installed, but we still need to get it power. Um, and the easiest way would be to get something like this uh, serial ATA power splitter, as well as a serial ATA to four pin adapter. But alternatively, you can just add a third SATA power connection using one of these press-on style connectors. And I'll elaborate on that when we get to cable management. Also, if you have a higher RPM fan, you can use something like one of these resistor cables, which reduces the voltage to the fan. But I won't be using one of these since the fan that we're using is already pretty quiet. Just a quick note though, if you have a 3020 or any of the other models that uses a standard three pin fan header for the rear fan, 
Don't think that you can just add a splitter and run it off that, because you can't. It just doesn't supply enough voltage. Don't ask me how I know. Just kidding, I know because I tried it. Doesn't work. Now I'm gonna take care of our hard drive here. And I've seen people use the tabs that I removed in the fan mod video, and while that's perfectly fine, I just didn't like how that looked. So I installed this in the bay right below the optical drive, and we have a couple of options. There are brackets like these ones that you can use to adapt a three and a half inch drive to a five and a quarter inch bay using the spare screws that should be in the front panel. But if you don't wanna buy these brackets or for some reason you're missing those screws, you can just use some screws with a flat head not to be confused with one of those stupid mm. flathead screws. Anyways, you'll still be able to install the latch and you can just screw it on on one side and that'll hold the drive securely. You could use some regular screws, but you'd have to cut out a notch in the back of the latch uh, to accommodate for the height of the screw. Speaking of which, we can go ahead and reinstall our latch, which will take a little force if you're using those flat screws. However, these aren't your only options and there are a number of five and a quarter bay solutions that could be more useful depending on what you're doing. Since we're installing this SSD, we need to figure out where we're gonna mount it because my drives. And this is just one option, but I like to mount it to the back panel right next to the fan using some of these 3M command poster strips. Um, they'll hold it securely, but can be removed easily in case you have to pull the drive out. Um, I also like to leave about an inch on the left side for cable management. Speaking of which, I'm gonna be putting down two of these zip tie mounts and uh, run two of these uh, medium zip ties so we can bundle up the cables nice and cleanly uh, once we uh, get to cable management. Speaking of which, now we can deal with our cable management, but mounting our SSD like this presents us a problem. And that's that the uh, power connector on this cable is now facing the wrong way. Uh, the simplest solution would be to just get a SATA power extender with a straight connector, but I find that it's easy enough to just flip the existing connector over on this cable. Um, you can do that by prying off the end cap and pushing out the wires, then flipping the connector over to the other side. It's pretty easy to do, and you just need to make sure that the wires are staying on the same terminal. Just take a look at the connector, and you can see this locating notch at the end. The wire at the locating notch is the 3.3 volt lead, while the middle wire is the 5 volt, and the wire on the opposite end is the 12 volt. The two black wires in between those are both grounds. Now, you can always do these one by one if that's easier for you, but once you line each one up, just push the wires back into the terminals using something like a flathead screwdriver and uh, put the end cap back on. Now, keep in mind that the colors of these wires will vary from system to system, but the order of the wires is always the same. If you decided to opt for adding an additional push-on SATA power connector to power the front fan, you just need to follow the same method. Uh, if you need to, just use the existing connectors as a guide, lining up the correct cable starting at the locating notch. With that out of the way, we can now connect up all the drives and the fan. Now we can run our data cables for the drives, and you're going to need an extra one that's about 16 inches in length for the relocated hard drive. Uh, now remember to plug the SSD into the blue SATA port and the hard drive into the black SATA port. Then you want to run the optical drive off one of the upper, slower uh, SATA connections, which are beige. And now we can go ahead and rerun our front header ports. Um, and don't forget that temp sensor. Then I'm just going to zip tie that to the USB cables along with the fan cable. And now we can bundle up this main run of wires and secure them with the zip ties. All right, we're almost there. And the GPU is the last thing that I'm going to install, but before I do that, we need to talk about these uh, PCI Express to serial ATA power adapters. I've gotten quite a few comments about these, like, you know, people saying that you should never use one. And as I showed in that last video, uh, these are perfectly fine, so long as you're not asking too much of them by putting them on an overly power-hungry GPU, or trying to use them um, to run on a power supply that shouldn't be running said GPU. That's also provided you don't buy one that's entirely garbage. Speaking of which, there will be links for everything that I've been using uh, down in the description. Getting off that tangent, 
We can finally finish up by plugging in the adapter and installing our GPU. So the build's finally complete, and I think it turned out pretty good. But it doesn't really matter if it's a turd or it costs too much. And I want to start by talking about performance. And this is going to be tricky since we're trying to compare this build to current gen consoles. And a lot of people on the internet like to think that consoles and PCs are easily comparable when it comes to performance, but they're not. And that's because consoles are playing by a different set of rules. Now, I don't want to get too far off into the weeds here, as I could really do an entire video about the technical aspects of consoles, but that's not really the focus of this video. But what I will say is that they are generally rendering at lower resolutions and then upscale to their target of 1080p or 4K. They make use of things like dynamic resolution, anti-aliasing, and running at lower to medium settings, which are also dynamic. So things are constantly changing on the fly. This is because on the hardware side, the PS4 and Xbox One have a GPU that's equivalent to, say, a GTX 750 on the desktop side, while the PS4 Pro is closer to the 1063 gig, but the Xbox One X is closer to the 1066 gig in our budget build here. Now, I'm not saying that all of this is a bad thing. I'm just saying that it makes it difficult for me to make an entirely scientific and objective comparison here because this is all about consistent, repeatable results. And that's why I don't have the consoles represented in these graphs. I don't know how to get detailed frame rate and frame time analysis from consoles, but I've done a lot of research uh, for this video and it seems that there's a way to do this, but I ran out of time and didn't want to make an oranges to apples comparison based off someone else's testing. Anyways, let's actually look at some benchmarks here and I tested a handful of games at 1080p that are all available on both consoles as well as PC. Starting with Doom, I tested on the Ultra preset and our average frame rate ended up being 128 frames per second with the 1% lows coming in at 92 and the 0.1% at 79. In Apex Legends, I was testing on the high preset and we got an average frame rate of 88 with the 1% being 67 and the 0.1% was 60 frames per second. Next up is Far Cry New Dawn on the high preset and we got an average of 70 frames per second with our 1% lows at 54 and the 0.1% being 39. Moving on to Battlefield 5, on the high preset our average frame rate was 90 with the 1% lows being 60 and the 1% ended up at 50 frames per second. Now we can't do a budget build without testing Fortnite. And on the epic preset our average frame rate was 87 with the 1% being 65 and the 0.1% being 33. Lastly, we have Battlefront 2 set to the high preset, and we got an average frame rate of 94 with the 1% dropping to 62 and the 0.1% measuring at 35 frames per second. Now, even though I don't have them in the graphs here, what I can say from my research is that all of these games are locked at 60 frames per second on the consoles, save for Far Cry New Dawn which is locked at 30 frames per second. What I will say about the testing that I looked at from other people is that even though the frame rate is locked, that doesn't mean that it always stays there, and there are frame drops below that target all the time. Also, the frame times aren't always great either. So comparing all of this to our budget build, uh, which is rendering out at 1080p with higher fixed graphics settings, games just look better, and our budget build was easily maintaining well above 60 frames per second at those settings with those frame rates being more consistent too. We can even turn the settings down a little and get around 60 frames per second at 1440p in a lot of games. And if you want to run at the equivalent 4K, you can always play on a 4K TV and have it upscale for you. I imagine the experience would be about the same graphically as the Xbox One X, but with more consistent and higher frame rates. After all, a smoother gameplay experience is really the goal here, especially in fast motion games like first person shooters. And our budget build really just does a better job of that. Now, this is all irrelevant if our budget build here comes in at a higher cost than our consoles. So for our base 9020, I spent $107.32, uh, and that came with an i5-4570, 8 gigs of DDR3 clocked at 1600 megahertz, 
and it also came with a 500 gig hard drive. Our 1066 gig cost us $133.54, and the SSD cost us $30 even. The fan was $9.50, and all the cables and brackets came to a total of $30.20, giving us a grand total of $293.56. When we look at the sold prices of used consoles, we can see that the PS4 and Xbox One cost about $100 less than our budget build, but it's substantially better than the vanilla versions. The PS4 Pro and Xbox One X are really the competition for this PC, and they cost about the same as our budget build. However, our budget build still wins out performance-wise. Now, it's been brought to my attention that the price of 7020s and 9020s has gone up drastically since I made the buyer's guide video. Naturally, I immediately headed over to eBay to look at listings, and what I found was more and more sellers than usual are asking way too much for these. More so, I found a few instances where people actually paid upwards of $180 for them. I'm, I'm honestly really not sure why, but what I am sure of is that I stand by my advice in that video, which is you should stick to around $120 on these all in. Don't go paying more unless you're getting extras like tossing in a bigger hard drive, an SSD, more RAM, or a GPU, and even then, Compare that to the cost of just buying those upgrades and installing them yourself. That being said, I looked again last night and found a handful of current listings for close to $100, so I'm still able to find them for around that price. Also, you have alternatives, as I'm not seeing the same trend with uh, the other models. You'd be better off trying to get a 3020 for less than $100 and then just replacing the power supply. Or maybe getting a 7010 or 9010 with an i7-3770 for about $160 and addressing the issues I talked about in the buyer's guide. Honestly, even spending a little bit more for a 20 series with an i7 makes a heck of a lot more sense than paying close to $180 for one of these with an i5. So, I feel like I've clearly accomplished what I set out to do with this series. Our budget build came in at about the same cost, but better performance. And honestly, it's possible to do a build like this for even less. Not only that, but I've had people comment on my videos and call these systems a dead end, which really that's entirely false. You can always upgrade the CPU to an i7, toss in a decent power supply, and then put a 1080 Ti in one of these if you wanted to. But more on that in a later video. Honestly, it really seems that the only valid argument that could be made for consoles anymore is convenience. But all that being said, I want to be clear that I'm not trying to convince you one way or the other of which way to go here. I'm just trying to help people make a more informed decision and perhaps show them that there's an option they might not have thought they had. Perhaps down the road, I can make an objective dedicated PC versus console video. Anyways, thanks for watching and I hope you found this helpful. If you did, consider tossing this video a like and consider subbing to see future videos. If you have any questions or comments, just drop them down below. And as always, any links to any products or tools used in this video can be found in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you with the next video.